I'll introduce myself to all of you guys. We'll see if I can remember your names at the end of this thing. But um, <laughs> my name is Marty Kelly. I am the, I'm the sheriff in Goody County. Also, I'd like to introduce Jen Hoffschulte. She's going to be host. She has hosted this. This is her second year. Yeah. Um, we didn't have one 2019, correct? That's correct. So I got Jen on a, on a federal um, community engagement grant in 2020, right at the end. Mm -hmm. And so that's her full-time job, and she has been out in the community doing community engagement, and that's that's been a big thing for us. She she goes to well, she sets up our fair booth, um, she skates, we she has she organizes coffee with a deputy every couple weeks. We go to throughout the entire county, um, and those have been really good um, things for us. So thank you for putting this together. She asked me if we were going to do it again. I said, well, last year was a huge hit, so absolutely we are. Uh, she put a nice schedule together for you for what? What did I just count? Nine weeks. Thanks, so, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's who's going to be your host, and she's got a a big list for you um, each night. We're gonna. I don't know. Chad's going to talk a little bit. My communications captain, um, who I also got in 2019, right? End of 2019. Yep. He manages the emergency operations center and our dispatch center. So a wealth of knowledge. So welcome everybody. Um, Thank you. Thank you for wanting to learn what we do on a daily basis um, because things have changed. Ray came, when did you come? When was your last community? Uh, that might be 10 years ago. 10 years ago. So Ray came to. I think there's like probably 20 at that class. That was a good class. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> so in 10 years from now, from 10 years ago, things have changed in law enforcement. I guess so. Yeah. Almost tenfold between communications, um, the jail, the how we operate on patrol it's all changed um, unfortunately most of it's changed in the last couple three years um, that we've been dealing with and you're gonna hear that throughout these nine weeks um, so my job here is just to welcome you and thank you for coming um, I'll poke my head in periodically on some of these evenings I'll for sure see you on your last evening um, and certainly Jen's gonna give out all our information on here um, with my number, you guys can get a hold of me if you need anything. Um, and I guess if you have any questions right off the get go for me, let's have them. And if not, throughout this process, if you have any questions that Jen can answer, which I doubt, um, let me know. So, and did you find that photo yet? I did. I, I, I maybe I'm just. What, what was your What was your child's? So we did a. a trunk or tree and that's what again another thing she does <laughs> i know I'm gonna, I'm what was what was like, he or she dressed up she in? she was a sock hopper or like teeny bopper girl and oh, okay. we were rushed towards the end and she was nervous to take a picture with you I'm like no you have to <laughs> <laughs> well so those are the kind of things that we want to get kids to not be nervous about mm -hmm. um that's why we do it and exactly. you know, when we can say this is the sheriff or this is a deputy mm -hmm. take your picture they're all right guys and yeah I know um, I have it somewhere, but. <laughs> well, I think you, you, you helped us in, in proving the point that if we can get out to, to the kids and adults as well, but um, we kind of do focus on the kids a lot. Um, we are human and, and that's what you're gonna find out in these next several weeks. Um, some of it that we deal with isn't so good. And, and I'm glad Howard is here because Howard is one of our brand new chaplains that we started a chaplain program this year. Uh, uh, he's actually kind of our, I'm going to call you what, a lead chaplain because um, he is. And we have four of those that, are, that, that volunteer and they're on call 24-7. They ride with our guys. They come out to calls if we need them. So that program is just fledgling, if you will. Um, but I'm excited about that one. It's important. Um, and we'll hear more about peer support and all that throughout this process, won't we? Yep. Yeah, so um, thank you again. Welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. Great. You'll, you'll learn a lot. It'll be fun. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Okay, Dan. All right. You're up or Chad? Um, I'm going to be real quick. We're just going to do a couple of housekeeping things. So um, how does this work? Anybody? Uh, I think if you tap the screen, <laughs> so and then there's like a little <laughs> tap it again. There you go. Whoop. Uh, Double tap again. See what you did. Uh, Giant. I there you go. And not, and then. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, all right. There, there you goes. go. Um, 
So I'm Jen, Jen Hassel. If you just call me Jen, it's fine. Um, I will be yeah, basically escorting you guys through this process. Um, I'm the community engagement deputy, like Marty said. Um, this is my job, hand, like being out in the community, engaging with people, um, making positive contacts. So this is my job. I love it. I have the best job in the world. Um, so just a few things. So class starts at 6.15. Try to be here by 6.10. Um, make every attempt to attend at least 90% of classes. We understand that sometimes you can't make it. If you can't make it and you want to know what you missed, we're recording the sessions so I can get those on YouTube and email you guys the links. So we understand things happen. We just want you to be involved. It's better if you're here. We can have better conversations, um, stuff like that. So if you do happen to miss something, just let me know and I'll get you the video. Uh, we have restrooms. There's actually a restroom right there. There's one right outside the door when you walk out. And then there's also one next to the elevator right out there. But if you go to the one out by the elevator, make sure there's somebody to let you back in that door. <laughs> All right? I got it here for you. All right. So silence your cell phones. If you need to make a call, just step outside. It's not a big deal. Um, we have water and snacks. Water's in the cooler. Snacks, help yourself. Um, the kitchen here actually made the, the cookies, so they're freshly baked today. Um, so help yourself with that stuff. Um, if you have any allergies, let me know so I can not bring that food here. Um, so each week we'll have different instructor instructors. Um, typically it'll run from 6.15 to 9.15. There are some days where we might get out early. Um, sometimes things don't go as long and sometimes they go a little bit longer. Um, all classes are held here except for tentatively the January 2nd one. Um, and we'll talk about that when that gets closer. That's just the Four Seasons presentation. And that's when we go out and check out all the boats and all the toys and stuff that we have. So that's what I got. That's the little housekeeping cleanup. Any questions? All right. Chad's going to come and talk to you and basically just run you guys through our admin staff. Yeah. All right, well, welcome. My name is Chad Steffen. I'm the communications captain in the sheriff's office, as the sheriff said. Um, I get the excitement of introducing a little bit of the office and the org structure. Um, otherwise, my day to day responsibilities are emergency communications and emergency management divisions of the office. So, with that being said, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, I, I just want to make one pointed point. Um, I think these are great. My mom went through one of these in Farmington, and it's what you put into it, what you get out of it. So, if you have questions through this whole thing, no matter what day that you're with Jen or any one of the other members of the office, ask, 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 right? There's nothing wrong with asking a question, how dumb it might be, or anything someone else might be thinking the same thing, right? So ask those questions, be involved, and uh, hopefully you'll take something away. And, I, and I'm, I'm most certain you will. So the Sheriff's Office Administration. Of course, we have uh, Sheriff Marty Kelly here. Um, there's a little bio there about him. And uh, he already kind of introduced himself there. So our Chief Deputy position is currently vacant within the office, but that Chief Deputy reports directly to the Sheriff. We have Major Michael Johnson, and Michael Johnson commands the patrol divisions of the Sheriff's Office. Um, 17 years in law enforcement with a variety of backgrounds, and so he has been serving the county since 2021. At some point, I think you'll meet Major Johnson, right? Uh, next one is Captain Collins Voxlin. Captain Voxlin commands the investigative division of the Sheriff's Office. Um, and in addition to this role, he's been a in many positions from dispatcher, patrol, patrol sergeant, canine handler, ERT, uh, drug task force, detective captain. Voxlin has served the citizens of Goody County since 1994. Myself, um, I already mentioned that I oversee emergency management communications division of the office. Um, been a, I am a public safety at large member with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency's SAFECOM program. I know, that's a mouthful, right? That's federal bureaucracy for you. Um, I've been serving with the county since 2019, prior coming from the city of Red Wing Police Department. Captain Heather Stevens. 
She is our captain of the Adult Detention Center. She also has served as a detention deputy, detention sergeant, and ABC lieutenant, and she has been with the county since 2021. Lieutenant Corey Ganyu, he serves second in command of the Sheriff's Adult Detention Center. Lieutenant Ganyu has also served as a detention deputy, detention deputy sergeant, background investigator, use of force instructor, and assistant administrator. Uh, born and raised in Goodyear County, and he's been serving the citizens since 2001. Very good. Did you have anything else for me? All right. I don't think so. Josh. So, command staff, really quick, you'll learn so much about the org chart of the sheriff's office and all the different positions. What are we, 104? 105 employees. 105 employees, many of whom you'll meet throughout the variety of divisions. So, um, I look forward to when you come up and you'll probably visit with Wayne Betcher at some point. He is one of our dispatch sergeants. Um, who oversees the dispatch center has been with the county for about 30 years as well. So very exciting stuff. And a sheriff could probably tell you, I could talk your ear off about emergency communications and infrastructure and all that stuff. And, and hopefully I'll get an opportunity to do that again. So I'll stand for any questions or any remarks from sheriff. No, um, I have a, a posse meeting here at 630. So we have a volunteer posse that I'm sure is on our list as well. So um, 25 of those uh, volunteers really do a good job for us too so um, and they help with the fair and, and Darla is well aware of that uh, so I'm gonna go meet with them and, and call it a day after that so thank you all again and thank you Chad very good uh, I think next up is Josh Hansen our emergency management director I'll turn that over to him how's everybody doing good, good. I'm Josh Hansen. I'm the uh, emergency management director of uh, Goody County, uh, county level uh, emergency management guy. So I'm gonna try to make this not boring for you because this is very uh, complex and it can be really boring, but guys like me find it really exciting. Maybe you will too. You'll have to uh, figure that out um, as we go through here. So I'm just gonna break this down, uh, try to simplify it. I have a habit of kind of uh, complicating things. Uh, right Josh, you might have to use the clicker that's on the podium there. I found that to work out the best. It's on the podium. Here we go. Can everybody hear me fine? All right. So in the emergency management division of uh, Goody County, there's uh, really uh, three key people with that. Uh, Chad, he's the uh, general oversight of it. Myself uh, as a director. And Missy Sibidi, she's not here tonight. She's our part-time uh, staff member. She uh, assists me with uh, pretty much everything. Plus, she also works a lot with uh, Chad's uh, communications pieces and also our uh, GIS. Um, so who here has had a uh, emergency address system before? Anyone out in the rural? You have your emergency house numbers, property addresses? Yeah. Well, she's the one that will actually plot those out and get those made for you. So if you ever need a replacement address, uh, you send that to our, our office and Missy would actually get it printed off right in the back room back there. So that's where those all come from, all those placards. So she does a lot. So our number one uh, priorities with emergency management, obviously to uh, Number one, protect life and safety. Once we uh, get past all of our life-saving uh, measures, it uh, comes down to uh, minimizing the impact on property and then the environment. Um, so if we look at like a chemical spill, uh, let's say a train tips over in the city of Red Wing, there's no immediate life threats and we move on to containing that spill. And we have uh, plans in place and we have uh, a lot of people all the way from the federal government all the way down to the local level here that will help us uh, contain that spill on the Mississippi River. And we actually just did a, a tabletop for that here uh, last week. So with uh, trains and uh, pipelines and uh, the increased traffic on the river, which we'll talk about here a little bit, uh, the uh, protection of the environment is a, a huge component of what we uh, work with. And a lot of it's just kind of coordinating the partners, which we'll talk about here shortly. Secure and restore our critical infrastructure. So we all like having power, right? That's part of our job to kind of help uh, coordinate between all the power companies and uh, co-ops in the county. Um, if we had a uh, uh, loss of power, generally for more than, uh, uh, let's say, a day or two, uh, we can start opening up shelters. Uh, we can talk about that, too. There gets to be a, so it's going down a rabbit hole, but it is a, a very uh, key piece to what this uh, function up here is, this entire room. 
Other critical infrastructure, um, we look at are just our roads, being able to travel to point A to point B, because if we can't uh, travel, we can't really do much of anything, especially we all see the impacts of uh, the supply chain just during COVID. Now imagine a disaster like they're dealing with in Florida right now, down in uh, the Fort Lauderdale area, and uh, what was the island down there? Um, Pine Island. Pine Island, yeah, which, not here, we got plenty of calls. There, there, there's out. a funny story to that, so just to, uh, you're too far off topic here, Josh, or to interrupt you, yeah. but Pine Island, Florida is a thing, right? It's a little island that got hit real bad with the hurricane. Our 911 center, since that hurricane came through down there, it's been overloaded with calls. Everyone looks up Pine Island, right? And they get the phone number for our dispatch center that serves Pine Island, Minnesota. And so there are so many calls that we actually had to put in our, in, as a transfer button in our phone system here <laughs> to Pine Island, Florida. So, but yeah. Small country, small. <laughs> so that's a critical infrastructure, and uh, there's a uh, there's FEMA writes a bunch of manuals that are about this thick. At the end of the day, you don't believe me, they're in my office back there. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to look through them. But uh, it's it's kind of how we prioritize all of our efforts when it comes to uh, we have a tornado hit. What do, what do we have to uh, restore first? We gotta get the lights on. We gotta get the power on. We gotta get the roads open so we can get responders in and out, and utilities and stuff like that. So all these real uh, general concepts, uh, these priorities, they kind of play into everything, uh, down to the minute-by-minute minute response out in the field. And then uh, the ultimate goal of any uh, emergency, they say it starts at the local level and it ends at the local level, and it's ultimately to resume just our normal uh, um, everyday life. Um, as we look at down in Florida right now, there's parts of Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale area, again, um, the Sanibel Island, um, they're talking already um, excess of a year before they're gonna have power down there right now. So if we look at uh, some other disasters like uh, I believe it was the 2021 uh, Texas ice storm. And you remember hearing about that down in Texas? They got hit there. They were without power for about 72 hours and it was uh, about 250 people, don't quote me on the exact moment, that were killed or froze up in their homes like that. So when we start talking about the priorities and uh, coordinating with our power companies and all, to get that critical infrastructure up, that's exactly why we're doing it. So that moving. I get kind of accused once in a while of uh, being chicken little. Um, I, I don't completely live in a world of uh, bad things, but everything up here is uh, preparing for a bad day so we can reduce it to make it less impacting. So it's okay if you call me chicken little, I guess. <laughs> so kind of how uh, this office here, this this floor here, including what Chad's got over there, uh, how this uh, fits into the larger scheme of things. So the United States is actually broken up uh, with FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. They're kind of the lead uh, people with emergency management across the country. Um, everyone's heard of FEMA, I'm sure, to some capacity. Um, so there's different uh, regions, uh, 10 regions. We're re FEMA Region 5. So all the uh, people above the county and state level, they all come out of Chicago, and we just recently had them up here for the nuclear power plant. They got out of here, Region 5. And then each region uh, kind of works with a with the Minnesota Homeland Security Emergency Management out of St. Paul, but then the state gets broken down into different regions. So we break it down into regions for a number of reasons. Uh, probably the biggest reason is it creates a partnership between uh, however many counties we have in, down here in Southeast Minnesota. We go all the way over to uh, uh, Blue, Blue Earth and uh, Nicollet counties over there. So we got like Albert Lee, um, that, that whole area over there, all the way down into uh, um, Olmstead, Houston counties. So a disaster happens, a uh, tornado comes, uh, every one of these emergency managers in this region can actually go into that area and help uh, coordinate uh, the emergency efforts, whatever it might be. And then there's uh, some shared assets. It's broken down a lot like what the communications uh, networks are, which Chad will talk about later on, I believe. Right? Maybe later. Yeah, no, we can at some point. Sure. Oh, I thought. Okay. <laughs> well, you're on tonight. So, but, uh, so yeah, we're uh, Region 1, uh, Emergency Management Homeland Security. So what I report to um, outside, so my job is kind of, it's different, it's very unique. So I work for the Sheriff's Office, but yet I work kind of report directly to Homeland Security Emergency Management. So Minnesota statute says that every county, every city has to have an emergency management function. So every city council and every county board has to appoint a person like me facilitate the emergency management function of that local county. So by statute, that's where, where this uh, Homeland Security Emergency Management gets in place. 
and they appoint a person in charge of the, the region. So it's a regional program coordinator, and that's who I call. Um, so would that explain why it seems like everything is military structure? You have lieutenants and majors, but you're a director. Is that, but you know, is that? It just seemed unusual when I saw the title difference. Is that partially why? I would say no. It's more, uh, it's just kind of what the job description, I guess, when I was originally wrote. You know, some uh, towns just have an emergency manager and some have an emergency coordinator. You get into uh, the private sector and you get to find a various number of uh, uh, job titles for what I do. Uh, for the county, I think it's pretty common to have emergency management director. Um, it, so I wouldn't really say that uh, there's anything real significant with that, other than that somebody at some point uh, wrote the job title and that's what they called it. So, but emergency manager, emergency management director, it's all kind of a, it's the same thing, just different title. So this is kind of how the hierarchy works here in the sheriff's office. Again, I report to Chad, and then we go to the sheriff. We have like a disaster declaration, like we had uh, last uh, December. We've had a series of tornadoes, which I'll show you guys a little bit on that here too. So pretty much me and the sheriff will go directly to the board and we start coordinating efforts. And generally what that means is we're gonna go ask the board for an emergency declaration. That way we can start spending money um, on an emergency basis that we would get reimbursement for later on. And that's really uh, the number one, following a disaster or even something like, so let's say we have a flood that's upcoming. The number one thing we wanna do is get that emergency declaration. You've probably seen that in the papers. And the reason we do that is because we can, it opens up our options for contracting and, and spending money to start a disaster response to protect our critical infrastructure and some other entities out there. So, so these are some of the partners we work with. Um, it's uh, Truthfully, I learn about a new partner about once a month, I think. It's, uh, every month there's somebody new who's like, wow, um, everyone kind of hears the, 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 the joke about the alphabet with the federal government, all the agencies there. Well, it ain't much different. So we work with all local level government, uh, volunteer agencies, uh, county agencies, state agencies, state volunteer, um, federal uh, partners. There's a lot of people. And at some point when we have this whole emergency operations center back here working, we have a little bit of everything in this room. It gets pretty full in here. And actually we have people sitting way over here too. So but really when it comes down to it, a disaster, or a larger emergency response, you can bet that one component of pretty much each of those uh, may at least be monitoring the situation. So they get pretty uh, manpower intensive pretty quick. And we have some special and very unique uh, things here in Grady County, which we'll talk about. So what, what do I do like day to day? It's kind of hard to explain. And sometimes uh, we don't really know every day. It's uh, something different. Number one thing, um, just maintain situational awareness. You just gotta know what's going on out there. Um, one example of that was uh, the avian uh, influenza, the highly pathogenic avian influenza that was affecting the bird flocks throughout the state of Minnesota and the country. We were kind of monitoring that from the onset when it was in the East Coast. It, it goes with the migration flyways. So if, if you understand Goody County, you understand that we have a large agricultural base here in Goody County. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact uh, dollar amount, uh, how it plays into the uh, uh, the national economy, but it's significant. I think just Goodyear County alone, just in the dairy production, is like number six in the state of Minnesota, if not the country, I believe. Um, and we're only beat out by a couple other counties in, in the state of Minnesota. I believe one is up by uh, St. Cloud. But uh, we have a, a poultry uh, footprint here. Western Minnesota ended up getting that. So as this thing was kind of coming in, we were just kind of monitoring and um, more aggressively get prepping for it. And fortunately, um, it didn't impact us here in Goodyear County um, as bad as it did uh, Western Minnesota. Um, but there were some places that lost their entire uh, turkey and uh, poultry flocks up there. So we deal with that situational awareness aspect of it. Um, I'm always running over the chat telling about some new thing that's coming, space weather, whatever. Hey, you know, there's always something. It's kind of where the chicken little thing comes in, but that's kind of the name of the game. If you see something coming, you got to start prepping for it. You start talking to your partners, and uh, really just comes down to the initiative at the local level to start getting ready for that coming line. Uh, planning, it's uh, every day we're planning. I've got binders back there like this. We're just always pulling plans, reviewing plans. Some of it's required uh, for the state and federal requirements and grants. You know, this stuff uh, is just by, by needs. Like I, like I said, if we uh, died avian influenza, we were probably two months ahead of it, and uh, we had the plans drafted up, and we had it out to a partner, so we kind of knew what we were gonna do at our level before we even uh, got close to us here. So 
That's why we maintain the situation awareness, and that's why we're always kind of looking at the plans. And we have a nuclear power plant in Lake Bilzer Dam, uh, which I can tell you all the uh, horror stories about those things, which nothing to freak out about and lose sleep over, trust me, on those. But uh, um, those require continuous plans. They're very complex pieces, a lot of partners involved with that. So a lot of planning, a lot of writing, a lot of reading, a lot of studying. Then we have a lot of uh, laws and uh, requirements we have to meet with uh, FEMA. A lot of what we do up here is all grant work. So we have uh, emergency management preparedness grants um, that comes from, well, eventually, uh, it originally comes from FEMA, but then the state administers it. So we have to do a lot of uh, reporting requirements on that. We have to apply for it every year. And then we also have our radiological emergency preparedness grant which uh, we get through Excel Energy. Excel Energy gives uh, the state of Minnesota a big chunk of money, we're talking, uh, I don't quote me an exact figure, uh, maybe a million and a half, two million dollars. And the state of Minnesota facilitates all uh, emergency preparedness for the nuclear power plants. We have two of them in the state of Minnesota, Monticello and Prairie Island here. And that money comes down to local levels, so the impact of counties are on the 10-mile uh, emergency planning zone, which I can lay out here shortly. But that's more grant work. We have to uh, show that we're actually doing something to get that money. So if you look around, uh, we have a lot of stuff here. Chad's got a lot of stuff in the communications world back there. The reason we have a lot of that stuff is, uh, it's a very fortunate thing that we have a nuclear power plant down here. I say fortunate because we have a lot of uh, money that comes at us to prepare. And that preparedness also helps us out with everything else that we have to prepare for. And a lot of counties simply just don't have that. So what we have up here is, I would say it's pretty unique and we're pretty far ahead of a lot of counties, it's what compared of uh, the other 87 counties out there. I'm not going to go into this, uh, that will put you right to sleep, I won't be right to you tonight. But uh, kind of the, the root, uh, the core of our, our job is at our level, we want to be able to accomplish all these things, so these core capabilities here, and we want to have plans and, and resources and assets in place to be able to accomplish all these things here. So you can see how detailed and uh, complex this uh, gets pretty quick. But uh, it's, you gotta be a kind of special person to really find this interesting. And, uh, <laughs> most people laugh at me, including my wife, when I start talking about it. But uh, it's interesting. Chad and I, we, we chuckle over it too. It's good stuff. So what you're sitting in right now is really technically the Emergency Operations Center. So if we have a train tip over in downtown Red Wing or we have a tornado um, hit, let's say, Denison, we can activate this facility here, bring in all of our partners, the ones I showed you all the, the logos for, and we sit around and we can support whatever's going on up there. It, sometimes it might just be we make a phone calls, we can get planning teams, a whole bunch of stuff, big floor plan, a lot of people, kind of chaotic, but uh, we're basically supporting any event that can occur in Goody County from this room here. And most recently, we just did a uh, full-scale exercise uh, with the nuclear power plant out there, um, Prairie Island. And we had probably 80 people in here working. So it's, uh, it's a thing. But uh, that's what this is, and it's a uh, key component to anything uh, out in the county. We can also use this for like severe weather events. I'll talk about that in another one coming up here. Uh, but we have a... Uh, Chad has got, over there in the corner, which you'll see in another one, he's got a whole bunch of uh, maybe uh, ham radio users in here, amateur radio, anything. So we got a console in the back there, we bring in ham radio people, we have uh, some weather people, there's Skywarn, and we can actually even coordinate some stuff in uh, response with the severe weather coming into the county from, from in here too, with uh, very few people actually, but just to help the dispatch center out. So we have a plan, um, a plan of plans, I guess is the way to put this. Um, so it's a binder about this thick and then there's about six other binders alongside of it. And that's kind of all of our uh, emergency operations plan for the county. And this is kind of how it's laid out. So we have a basic plan, and which is kind of a general just concepts of how we are going to accomplish emergency management or emergency response preparedness, training, all that. But then we have plans for the nuclear power plant and the Lake Bills Dam, and then we have a listing of um, every hazardous facility. So we have like, uh, see where all this anhydrous in the county is like stored in certain locations. Um, some of the factories, uh, ADM, downtown Red Wing. 
So they're all required under uh, what's called a Sarah Title III. It's a law that basically says if you have a, a substance on your premise that can harm or kill somebody, you have to report it to us. So we have full situational awareness of where all this stuff is, and we take that information of where their location is, and we plot it into that GIS mapping, um, this global information system. So there's a bunch of map makers on electronics, right? And they plug in each of these locations where these places are. So if we ever had an, an event or an incident, we know where all those chemical factories are or chemical locations are, whatever it might be. So it just helps us with, with our situational awareness and our response and our planning on that. We can draw rings around there, show like 10 miles out, and put it up on a board there. And all the people working inside the room here can start making plans with whatever their component is. Whether they're driving the school bus and they want to stay outside of those rings, or whether they're uh, the fire department trying to set up a perimeter around there to contain it. That's how all this stuff kind of intertwines. So, like, if there was a tornado went through Goodhue or whatever, yep. this would tell you to go check the hydrous tanks or for 100 percent. Yeah, so you just yep. pull this up and you know exactly where to go. And not only works. that, with that data layer that I was just explaining, um, we can actually start uh, importing uh, um, data as far as uh, field reporting of damage. So that it eventually it will print out to be a giant report as to what's going on. So it maintains the incident commander who might be up here or in the field. Um, as to what actually the bigger picture looks like. But you're absolutely right. Um, especially if we have like a, uh, well, I don't know. Um, tornado's probably the most likely thing. If you have a bunch of debris and we didn't know if like, there was an area that's gonna be uh, a hazardous materials location or something, that'd be a, a good thing to start looking at. Because obviously these debris fields can get pretty big too. And like, hey, maybe we just need to call in a state hazmat team because we know that there's a, a dangerous chemical here. That, but yeah, exactly. So we kind of, when we're looking at the uh, bigger picture, we look at three types of different hazards, and we could go on all day long. I actually got them listed out here, what everything that could happen here in Goody County. But uh, we call them uh, natural, human caused, and uh, technological hazards. So every four years, we're in the process of doing this right now, uh, we have to do what's called a Goody County All Hazard Mitigation Plan. So this is completely separate. But what this is, is we get together with all of our, our townships and our cities and our, our private sector uh, organizations, our volunteer organizations, and we all come to the table and we all kind of lay out everything bad that can happen. Whether it be a flood or whether it be a, uh, a earthquake, which we've had earthquakes in Minnesota, we just don't really hear about them very much. Um, tornadoes, uh, avian influenza, uh, foreign animal disease, uh, train tipping over. And what we do is we list what could bad, what bad could happen, and then we list ways we can reduce the risk and make sure if we can prevent it, or if it does happen, how can we reduce the impacts to us, the negative stuff. And what this ultimately can do is we can get FEMA grants for it. The big one right now is uh, with the uh, changing weather patterns. Uh, everybody's kind of looking at storm shelters right now. Um, I think we just had one for one of the churches in the county is actually just looking for a storm shelter, I think out in the Goodhue area. Um, it's going to be a big thing. A lot of these uh, structures weren't built with uh, real safe uh, uh, storm protection. And now we're seeing more of the high velocity winds uh, and tornadoes. Uh, they're starting to look at that. But if they get their piece identified on this plan, it's a very complex process again. But basically FEMA says, okay, you've identified this and now we will look at giving you some grant money for that. So that's kind of the, uh, one of the purposes behind it. It's really the biggest purpose for most of us. For us here, we just kind of look at it again for that situational awareness piece, and it kind of helps give us some guidance like what we're gonna do. Some places we'll do some like flood mitigation projects. Uh, um, we have a lot of flooding areas, whether it be a property buyout or we're gonna do like some natural uh, reservoirs to uh, kind of deflect some of those flood waters, a lot of different stuff. Kind of gives a blueprint to uh, reduce risk and reduce the impacts of the hazards, but it also gives us some grant money. And that will actually be coming out uh, starting up next year now. Um, we actually have contractors coming to do it for you. So you're actually gonna see this actually occurring. You'll see newspaper articles and stuff on it. So if you're involved with any of the churches or uh, um, uh, volunteer organization or anything, you'll probably get involved with this at some point. But if you're on any of the city councils or township uh, boards or anything, this will definitely be something to be part of. So there's a lot of lists of, uh, long lists of, of uh, Awesome stuff that can happen day to day. Um, so, we kind of look at this. 
what are, we, what are we doing when we go through that uh, hazard mitigation process is we, we take everything that can happen. It might not be emergency management related, um, or it might just be something we kind of pay attention to up here, but we just we try to maintain the big picture up here just so we can help out uh, wherever we can um, for whatever it is. So we look at uh, pandemics, epidemics, infectious disease, uh, mental health, uh, you know, again, mental health isn't really something we're dealing with up here, but it's still something that impacts everything. Maintain a 30,000 foot view with the bigger picture and stuff. Severe thunderstorms and tornadoes and droughts and wildfires is actually something that's uh, been popping up here more recently because we can't seem to kick this drought status that we're in. Very low level drought right now, uh, we, as we were last year. And, uh, it's definitely impacting and uh, there's some concerns about even next spring now with the droughts and the, the wildfire. So Western United States, I mean, that's that's a bread and butter as wildfire response. Here, not so much. And uh, we've actually been dealing with uh, some pretty significant grass fires. I think last week we had three uh, simultaneous grass fires going on. So uh, again, with uh, weather patterns and everything changing, I mean, it was just something we're gonna have to be paying attention to. and. Uh, that wildfire one is something that uh, I'm kind of watching right now too and talking to some of the fire chiefs as to what we're going to end up dealing with that. But I foresee that they're going to have to bring in some uh, like wildland uh, firefighter training to kind of help with that piece and maybe see some of the equipment uh, changing up a little bit. But we'll see what the future brings us for that. Uh, aquatic invasive species, again, it's not really an emergency management piece directly, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, earthquakes, I think the last one I had, like I said, uh, I wasn't actually joking about that. We had one with Mankato and it was a real, uh, real, real light earthquake on the Richter scale, but it does happen. Um, we also got to look at regional impacts too because uh, southern United States, a large earthquake down there would impact us up here too with the fault lines and stuff. So it's uh, structure fires and ground and surface water supply contamination. Um, obviously, the Flint, Michigan was the last big one we heard about in the United States. Uh, they lost all their drinking water, but we've actually had some in Minnesota here too that are actually concerned with some of the uh, water quality stuff. And we were actually working on that last year of uh, trying to figure out how we could take, uh, let's say, two municipalities, like Zambrona and Juan Domingo, they run out of drinking water. What's the fastest way to bring them in uh, portable water? And uh, there's a couple different options out there, and um, it's not the uh, perfect solutions, but they're telling me that they can bring in these giant filters and stuff. And there's always, I believe that the National Guard would come in and just provide water for us, and that's absolutely not true. Um, they don't have those capabilities. I said the same thing too. I think they gave them the hook that you just gave me. So one thing I have learned in this job, above all things, is we cannot rely on somebody else to come help us here at our level. We have to be able to take care of ourselves here at the local level. So. That's where the importance of partnering and understanding who's in our community. And we actually have a water filter uh, um, distributor in Zabrota who kind of said that they'll help us out in the time we need. Hopefully that follows through. So, and hopefully we never need to pull that out. So. Some of the other uh, stuff we got, uh, Chad's kind of working on the cyber piece, cyber attacks. Uh, if you want to talk about probably the most likely thing to happen right now is cyber attack, whether it be small or large scale, uh, especially with uh, how things are going overseas right now. Uh, cyber is a huge thing. Uh, maritime accidents right here in the Mississippi River. I could go on all day long about some of the stuff that could happen out there. Aviation accidents, uh, we're right in the flight path for uh, Minneapolis uh, International, the cities, and then we also have like, the, uh, the smaller airports around us. Pipeline accidents, I say lower frequency, but it's still here. We do have uh, pipelines, which we'll show you here. Dam failures, um, that's another thing we'll break down here a little bit. So. so probably the number one most common thing is severe weather. Um, the most recent major severe weather case was uh, last uh, December of 2021. That was the last time we actually had a, uh, a disaster declaration here in Goodyear County. And I believe we had two tornadoes here in the county, but there was a lot of them all around. Actually, we tracked the storm early on from Colorado. We had a spotter network set up. So they were actually had eyes on it in Colorado and they followed it all the way up into here. And it was, it was really interesting how this thing developed and the thing just kept picking up speed and momentum. And is there anyone from uh, Kenyon area here? No? Okay. Yeah, it came in full speed in uh, Kenya. Yeah, we had some damage for that one. Um, 
and I forget how much the damage was. So not factoring in private infrastructure, but just like public infrastructure, like telephone poles and, and road signs. Road signs cost a lot of money. We were looking at almost like $90,000 on that. Um, maybe just short of that a little bit. We didn't meet the threshold. I think we had to meet like 96,000 if I looked at my sheet over there to get reimbursement on that. But the uh, private damage on that with the sheds and, and the farm sheds that were just flattened was enormous. And these are just EF0 tornadoes. So we're finding that uh, even just these, these storms, these straight line winds, anything over 70 miles an hour, you know, they're creating a lot of damage, even more so than uh, other tornadoes are on this. But uh, big squall lines on this one, they had a, they, uh, they call it a Direco. There's a historic, all the weather people are just nerding out over this thing for a long time afterwards, but uh, I didn't realize like, how significant it was, but it really just illustrated the uh, the fact that how the weather patterns are changing. And if anybody uh, is paying attention uh, to like the Tornado Alley, what it used to be, it is a fact that Tornado Alley used to be down in uh, South Central in Kansas area, and it is absolutely shifting up into Minnesota now, which has been a uh, we're seeing it because we're seeing the uh, severe weather stuff, uh, tornadoes, and South Central and Western Minnesota. We're getting the tornadoes up here, and again with that. Uh, I think that's going to create more of a need to have a sufficient sheltering and uh, facilities like that. So, just uh, how things are, are changing. So this, these two things here consume a lot of time, more so the periodic nuclear generating plant. You see a lot of the uh, the graphs and charts and maps all around the room here. It's all Prairie Island. So the interesting thing about the Prairie Island nuclear power plant and the emergency planning on that. The state of Minnesota is actually in charge of that. Um, so FEMA requires uh, Excel Energy to have offsite emergency preparedness, a whole bunch of stuff. It gets really complicated there. So Excel Energy pays the state of Minnesota, like I was saying, to say, hey, it's cheaper for you guys just to handle it than us to take care of it. And we benefit from it on the government side. And uh, the state of Minnesota says, okay, Goodhue County, Pierce County, Dakota County, we're paying you this, this money through this grant program to make sure that you guys are prepared for an off-site response. So on-site, uh, the, the Nuclear Regulatory, the NRC Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, they're in charge of everything that happens on-site. And it gets even more technical on there because now you're dealing with all the actual infrastructure of the nuclear power plant with the engineers and stuff. So it's a very complex web of uh, requirements and laws and uh, the regulations for that book is all like that right there. And uh, the plan is probably that. But uh, of all the things to lose sleep over, that is not it. Um, whatever you're feeling about nuclear power is, I'm here to tell you I've actually worked inside there, is a very, very safe thing out there. Um, there are so many layers uh, and levels of safety and control on that. Um, I wish half of that was applied to some of the other stuff that we have out there. But I'm not here advocating for nuclear power, I'm just saying, we see it in their uh, rear view mirrors every day, or their front windshields. It's, it's nothing to uh, lose sleep over. Granted, if we had a bad day with that, it's going to be a really bad day. But the likelihood of that is uh, pretty low. Fair enough. <laughs> Lake Billsby Dam, uh, they actually just got, uh, they're finishing up the project. They just uh, redid a lot of stuff with that. So the worst case scenario with Lake Billsby Dam, is I'm going to give you all these apocalypse stories I'm going to sleep tonight. So if Lake Billsby Dam were to fail, uh, the worst case scenario that we plan for is 52 feet of water engulfs the city of Cannon Falls in like 10 minutes. Sounds like a pretty good day, right? <laughs> so you can be reassured that they've uh, redid everything on that now, and I've actually been in there. There's so much concrete on that thing. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely a solid beast holding up that water right there. But other parts of the country that they don't have that real solid infrastructure you hear about the damn failures and it does happen um, what's more uh, risky in which it doesn't get into um, the news very much is we have the Bell Creek uh, watersheds so we have these earthen dams out in the middle of the townships out there and there's three dams that are actually listed as uh, high risk though it's not as catastrophic as uh, Lake Billsby Dam is uh, these three dams if they were to fail and again it's dirt it would cause, uh, we'd lose some highways, and um, there's a couple of farm sheds there in the path of that too. But uh, they're gonna wake up and they're gonna be pretty wet in the morning. But uh, 
We are working with, uh, what's that? OBS. Uh, where in Bell Creek are you? We're um, right, we're in Welch, at the end of Bell Creek and Cannon yeah. River. But you can check to see if your house is on a map over there. You got it all laid oh, out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it actually, we have uh, we have estimates over there. You can actually tell like where you actually sit in there and how much water you would actually see. Oh. It's all theory based, okay. but uh, it is a thing. Yeah. And that's the thing is, uh, everyone kind of looks, I don't know why it is, but everyone assumes like everything's going to move south, right? In Goody County, the highest point is actually in the southern part of the county. So everything moves from the south to the north into the river valley, right? So when we talk about these dams going, everything's moving north. It's going to go across County Road 9, uh, County Road 8, I believe, uh, a couple spots. Uh, um, there's a couple locations of that. So I don't know. I think you might be safe with the Bell Creek Farm. Um, Bills be damn, I don't know. We were before, we were not safe before the watersheds because we were wiped out a couple of times. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you can just check your house up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so we're working on, uh, working with the watershed district right now, actually, uh, um, the County Soil Water Conservation District, the uh, Bull County out there in Goodhue. And we're actually trying to get uh, some early warning out there um, to help out. So, because right now you don't really have anything. Mm -hmm. You just wake up and there's a lot of water sitting out in the front lawn or mm -hmm. underneath your bed, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to change that in that uh, hazard mitigation process that we were just describing before with the grant work. And you know, that's what we're gonna write in there so we can actually get some grants and hopefully uh, facilitate some of that. So you can kind of see how all this kind of comes around mm -hmm. on that. And what that would be is probably some gauges and maybe some alarms, but then that's all stuff we kind of got to tie in with. Someone's got to monitor that stuff. So there's a lot of discussion and decisions to be made on that stuff. But right now there's nothing, so we got to do better than that. So again, here's the drought. And again, with the drought, uh, yeah, we got the agriculture impact, uh, but the, we also got to look at the wildfire piece. Then also with the, the droughts too, uh, if we do get the rain, now we're looking at the flash flooding piece and that. So that's where that situational awareness piece comes in. Like, hey, there's a drought, but what are the actual risks? So when the first, we got this software we uh, purchased, it's called uh, DTN Weather Century. So the weather service is a great partner. They, they put out some really good data, but there's this other, uh, you probably, anybody that does uh, farming, DTN weather? No, I just assume you're farm, Don Deere hat on. No, <laughs> but uh, so DTN Weather is actually a locally based uh, company in uh, Bloomington, I believe. So private sector, they hire like uh, like eighty meteorologists up there. So they give an awesome, incredible product uh, weather. They're, they're predicting almost like a month out on some of the stuff. Um, so when we have these droughts, they'll actually give us uh, data on uh, um, like flash flood concerns, and they, they just do it all for us. And really, if we're in the middle of this drought thing, we just send out a situation report. And uh, so everybody, all of our partners, whether you're public works or your fire EMS or uh, whatever it might be, um, they can just be aware that, hey, if we get more than an inch and a half of rain, you could be looking at some of these roads washing out too. And actually, one of our number one threats with uh, flash flooding is these culverts. We have, uh, I want to say like 10,000 culverts, but it might even be like 30 or 40,000 culverts. I'm just uh, I'm talking about just the little culverts underneath the roads. Those things plug up, then uh, that's the number one way you're going to lose your roads and uh, your flooding is culverts. So, and the problem with that is too, you know, whether it's ten or forty thousand, I can't remember the exact number there is. We got them all mapped out in our GIS, but it is absolutely impossible for maintenance to get out there and clean those things out regular enough to make sure that the water flows underneath. So the water builds up and it washes them out. And you'll see it out there. I mean, if you're out in the country, you'll see. You see that stuff building up in the fields and eventually washes out. Welch is notorious for uh, washouts down there. County Road 7, that's washed out a few times. Um, and it doesn't take much to wash, you know, to plug those things up. So, one thing we're kind of on the, I want to say we're teetering on, but uh, the other piece of the drought is the Mississippi River over here. And this could be a huge impact here, especially during the agriculture season, the, the harvest. So, Mississippi River goes down too, right? And so we got to get all these barges up there. The barges need that uh, nine feet to travel up and down the stream to get all that. So 60% of the country's grain is just right up here. It goes right past here. So if that water gets too low, we can't get the harvest out down south for the export. So they actually have a, uh, there's a lot of other industry on the river. There's actually, you can't really see it in here, but uh, there's actually a plan um, that will trigger if the water levels get too low that all of us on the river have to be aware of. Um, it's like a called low flow plan. So if the water gets low, too low, um, the lock and dams will start to adjusting the river levels to uh, make sure we can at least get critical uh, transportation on there. 
The other hazard with that is too when the when the water when the river gets so low, and we've already seen this this year. You know, it channels everybody in to, to, towards the middle, right? There's more water, there's more room to go, but now we got all that commercial traffic out there, the barges, we got the commercial river cruises, the private boats, now everyone's in this tight little racetrack out there, and it increases the risk for uh, maritime collision out there in boats. So that's one of, uh, if you ask me, like one of my larger concerns out there, that would be one of them, especially uh, like a runaway barge downstream or something. We got ADM here, and we have these passenger vessels gonna be docking next year, we're talking about three of those things. It's about 3,000 people are gonna be lined up on our uh, port down here. We have a, uh, you guys familiar with the port down here? It's a uh, thousand feet. So the city of St. Paul has 500 foot port and we have a 1,000 foot port. So we have to do like all the refueling operations and everything here in the city of Redding because it doesn't uh, facilitate real well up in St. Paul. So it's just, a, just a thought on that too. It's just one of the things we do uh, pay attention to. I work with the city of Redding with that. They uh, have a schedule and they do all the refueling, but we actually have a care group that works with the oil company here. Um, so if they were to actually have a collision or a spill or something out there, they're like right there, they're gonna get stuff out there to help contain that, minimize the impact to the environment. See, I got a whole bunch of good news, don't I? So. Josh, are you good if we take maybe a 10 minute break? Oh yeah, 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 go ahead. Let's take a break in 10 minutes. Yeah, I think uh, the severe weather is probably the biggest one. Uh, we had the uh, Amtrak uh, incident here that was just uh, last, well, it was actually right before the tornadoes, uh, where we had a possible, uh, it was a biological threat on this train that stopped right down here. Fortunately, it turned out to be, uh, it was a really weird situation. So this uh, train was in Whitefish, uh, Montana, and it uh, had a guy dressed up in a biological suit. He hung himself in the bathroom. They pulled him off the train in Whitefish, uh, Montana. They did not check anything. They get all the way to Red Wing here. They're just coming into town, and all of a sudden they found a suspicious package that looked like a bomb. And of course, the one spot of the entire country where they stop is right here in good old Red Wing, Minnesota. <laughs> Fortunately, they stopped it uh, behind Barnes Bluff, so we automatically had uh, natural shielding right there. So we were able to protect a lot of the town, the wind direction we're going. But we had everybody down uh, for that. We had uh, hazmat teams, uh, we had bomb teams. And so we work with the bomb teams a lot, right? I, throughout my career, we've, the bomb team comes up and most of the time we kind of like whatever, okay, scared cops, whatever. I don't play with bombs, right? I don't like bombs. I've dealt them off my life. But they like doing that stuff, so that's how they're And normally they're just pretty easy going about it. Well, they get off the train after they're inspecting this thing, right? And there's a whole backstory on this that is just absolutely bizarre. And it sounded legit, it was absolutely legit. Cheating, legit, and uh, they weren't smiling when they got off the train. As a matter of fact, they uh, they actually called in more people, and they were like kind of nervous looking. And I've never seen a bomb team that nervous looking. And uh, they ended up getting it off. The FBI intercepted it, took it up in the range, and it ended up being a uh, inert device. But myself, uh, Chad, uh, the city of Red Wing, emergency manager Travis Bray, and a handful of other people, we were all kind of working back here. Then it was the storms, uh, December. We tracked that storm coming in from Colorado. And a lot of that is doing your damage assessments and coordinating with Skywarn and coordinating with the responders and uh, helping out our dispatch because they're getting overloaded in there. When a storm comes in, it, uh, and Jen's gotten the phone calls and the text me, hey Jen, we need to get someone on social media saying, hey, we're working on this. But the storm comes through, it's all quiet, and it's just chaos out there, then all of a sudden dispatch just blows up. I mean, you're talking hundreds of calls coming in. It's absolutely amazing when you sit back there and see that. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We kind of help alleviate some of that stuff. Hey, we got lines on here. We make sure there's no life safety issues, all that. So yeah, fortunately, we haven't had a dam failure. Fortunately, we haven't had a nuclear power plant uh, have an issue. Um, you know, a lot of stuff that just gets handled at the local level with your first responders on scene there. So all the field though, is plenty of that. But uh, you know, we don't want this to open up very much. And that's a, it's a fact. Unfortunate on that. So, I don't know if you're familiar or not, but uh, so we got uh, our EMS and our first responder efforts. Uh, everyone kind of knows the difference between the ambulance. So we have uh, Lake City Ambulance, Red Wing Ambulance, Kind of Falls Ambulance, and did I say Lake City Ambulance? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Zambrota ambulance. That's uh, Zambrota ambulance. They're our full time ambulances, so they can do all the transports and everything. The rest of our uh, medical service are first responders. And then our uh, fire services, the only full time fire department we have is uh, City Red Wing. Up here. The rest of it is uh, completely uh, volunteer uh, fire service. Very fortunate to have the volunteers we have. And then, you know, it's a stress on them, but uh, they, they do a good job with it. And the City of Red Wing has uh, their piece here. So part of what we do here is we actually coordinate the uh, fire fire service throughout the county too. So it's um, do like mutual aid agreements, and then we uh, we have like uh, quarterly meetings. We get to get all the fire departments together and just say, hey, here's what's going on over here, there, and uh, always bringing up new stuff and just kind of keeping the, the partnerships going there. And that's a big piece of what we do up here as well. So, well, we got the fire services there, and you got uh, you guys signed up for a code red. Yeah, so if you're Code Red, uh, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, there's another uh, option. Get, definitely get signed up for the Code Red. But if you don't have, uh, it's called the FEMA app. It's uh, FEMA, just, if you just Google uh, FEMA app on, there, uh, on the Google machine, you can get that on your smartphone or something. FEMA, uh, F E M A, and there's app, A P P. Come up. You can download that on your uh, smartphone. It actually gives you uh, up to date uh, or up to the minute uh, alerts and everything. Um, I think it's a good program to have. You can set, you, even if you go on vacation, if you're going to go to Florida, you got someone down in like Florida or wherever, you can actually program in their location. You've got kids down there or something. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of want to keep an eye on it's, it's pretty good. My phone's always blowing up. So, what's Code Red? So, Code Red is a, a subscriber based service, which means you have to sign, sign up for it. Pay for it? Nope, it's totally free. Everything I just told you about is completely free. And yeah, basically, if uh, there's a weather alert, um, like National Weather Service issues a severe thunderstorm warning or a watch or flood warning watch, whatever, um, it'll actually alert your phone. Um, but also with that, if we had an emergency in the county that we want to do a public warning for, um, we can get your code red um, through that as well. Um, it's different than all the Android. Yeah, so Android Alert and Blue Alerts, and those are completely different things, and those are used on a very, very strict basis, and those go across our emergency alert system. And this is a whole other rabbit hole that I don't want to uh, go down because it'll definitely put you to sleep. But uh, we also, we also, it, it's it's a, it's a very complex thing. We have a uh, system called what's called IPAWS, I P A W S. So we have the capability, and you don't even have to subscribe to this. This just comes to your phone automatically. We just we look at our dispatchers, look at a map, and just circle or put a polygon around an area, and everybody in that area will get whatever message we type in there. Um, and it's a very uh, we we slowly started transitioning in the last like two years, because we identified that you know that's a really effective way to alert people. So let's say we had a chemical spill at a location. Let's say the city of Goodyear has a chemical spill in there. We can just draw a square around the city of Goodyear and send the message out. And we can even put a link in that message on your phone saying, hey, go here for more information. Click on the link, and we can even put a video in there about saying, hey, here's what shelter in place, or here's how we can, here's what you need to do, here's where you need to go, here's more information here. So we have the warning technology here. Again, because we have that nuclear power plant, and we get that money coming in, we have a lot of these uh, uh, resources, and uh, we just have a lot of extra stuff we can uh, work with. Hopefully, uh, people well, not just based on where you're is registered they just know where you are at any wireless device in, within that circle that we draw on the map gets notified it matter if they're Verizon or T -Mobile doesn't matter or nope. whatever that cellular no nope. the newer the newer the phone the better but uh, we, we're seeing don't quote me on exact but I think it's like a 90% hit rate on the mobile devices going through an area versus where you have the subscriber base the code red like you have to subscribe to that and we can't reach everybody in that or like if we're dependent on landlines or phones it's just easier because then we, we have a lot of transient population too people driving commuting mm -hmm. driving back and forth um you know it, or if you're out in the middle of the field or if you're all down the Cannon river tubing or whatever down at the county fair mm -hmm. put a polygon right around the county fair and we can alert everybody that's in there that's good to know yep so if we had a uh Let's say we had an active shooter at the county fair. Yeah, something. Polygon like message, boom! Out, everybody in the county fair now gets it. Shelter in place, whatever the uh, message would be. If we know we have an imminent uh, tornado coming to the county fair, we could potentially do the polygon. Although they say severe weather is different, a set of criteria. 
But for that scenario, I, I'm confident we could do that. They don't. We don't want to over alert either. We don't want to be the people that are crying wolf all the time, and we don't do that. So actually, uh, you're going to start seeing if you haven't already. Uh, we do monthly tests. So if you're in like, have you, have you seen one yet pop up in your phone? So if I was you're thinking of your one o'clock Wednesday. No, those are siren tests. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's a whole other thing. <laughs> so. I think it lasted three minutes. They do last three minutes. Oh, yeah. before that it hasn't seemed, to, but that thing is just blurry. Yeah, they're they're supposed to. Right? <laughs> yeah, so, I'm like this. Yeah. Ah, what about ringing? <laughs> yeah. It's just once though. We do the full one. Then the other ones are canceled tests, so they're just real short. But yeah, the first uh, first Wednesday of the month, it's annoying. It gets all the dogs barking and howling and stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 definitely. Oh, it's one o'clock. Yeah. But you'll start seeing if you're in one of the towns, and we'll probably end up doing the townships too. But uh, we'll see an iPod's test. But there's certain ways to set uh, do settings in your phone, and uh, I'll be done shortly. You're good. Oh, okay. Yeah, no rush. Right. I'm just talking here. Yeah, nerd that's world. Good. Um, there'll be actually alerts put out for test alerts, and you can actually uh, do a survey and let us know that you actually received the alert and uh, if it worked. It's a way for we can test it, and it's a way for you to kind of be familiar with the system too on that. So it's called iPause. But, uh, that's uh, that's one little piece, and then uh, yeah, the siren test. So I think while we're talking about that, it's important to understand with the, the outdoor warning sirens that the intent of those is uh, really. For outdoor warning only. It really, the intent, the only reason we really have those in Goody County, like some of the towns have their own sirens yet, but really the only reason why we county has any involvement with them is because of the nuclear power plant. Um, that's why. So it, once in a while, uh, fortunately, we again because of the nuclear power plant, we have this capability of the outdoor warning sirens. But at this day and age, with all the technology and alerts are out there, um, it's kind of expected to at least have like a NOAA weather radio. Or an app on your phone. There's many of the apps out there right now. You should, I mean, you should see my phone when a severe weather event comes up. It just explodes. Mm -hmm. Both of them just going crazy. But uh, no, that's a thing. The uh, what's that? There's an app for that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of apps. Yeah, exactly. But that FEMA app uh, is actually a really good what one. What did you say the other one was? IPWS. Yeah. A -P -P. Actually, you lost me. <laughs> here, you know what? I can actually show you all this. It's, uh, we got time? Yeah. Okay, I don't want it. Yeah, I just have pillar stuff there tonight, so if I don't oh. get to my stuff, it's not a problem. This uh, FEMA app, I think it's a uh, good thing. It's, I mean, not everyone has the, uh, FEMA smartphone app. Oh, I can't do the application. I always does that with me on Google. Feel mobile products, yeah, so it'll pull up here. Yeah, so you can get on Google Play, the App Store, and uh, what, are you going to sense me from YouTube? Yeah. Disasters can happen. Yeah, there's a little video on the FEMA apps here. Wherever you are, the FEMA app is there. It can help you plan. So you actually go right to uh, their FEMA website, and they actually have it. It's pretty easy, but you can just go to the App Store or your Google Play, and you get it. I'm trying to think if it shows it. Oh, there used to be a flyer. change it up here. Hmm. Anybody try to find it? I'm doing a search. So then there's uh, one of the questions as to like what you can do like to prepare for some of this stuff. But, yeah, there's actually a website for that uh, too. And if people gives you like some... Do you know which one? <coughs> Yeah. I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, Ready.gov is a really good website. So it actually breaks down like these hazards like we're talking about. 
see you get the uh, oh, let's sort of see a power outage kind of gives you some tips and you just go to ready.gov if you have a uh, business uh, anyone here is a business owner or manager or anything they actually got the ready.business and it gives you a, it actually will lay out an entire like business plan for you too so yeah so I, I mean I'm not making up the stuff I'm talking about up here it's uh, here. It's, uh you're talking about food storage and uh you know, I think uh, the, the last guidance I seen was like month, three months or something. Food. I mean, if you really want to be prepared for stuff, I mean, it's we're pretty lucky and fortunate here that we get the power back on after uh, you know a couple hours. And I mean, if it's more than three hours, people are banging on the doors over the internet being out, right? It's but, kind uh, of nice if it goes out to fire. Yeah. <laughs> Some people appreciate that. Time, yeah. Well, just for a short while, it's okay. So I do believe, if I remember right, they did change up this, so it might look a little different now. But it should just be a uh, map on there. I don't care. But then you can set it up. You can put it in five locations. So like I said, if they know it's... Did, did you find it? No. There's, there's a quite a few to choose from. Yeah. Oh. Looking for where it put it. I think this would be the new app. Weather. I did FEMA weather because they had that little picture of the steamer you had up. Not more. Try it. Try it. This one? Yeah, the FEMA weather one. There's a Red Cross app too out there. You can do because that'll actually bring you into like if you want to donate blood and all that, and it'll show you like mm -hmm. shelter locations. And so they must have changed it because this is not what. Uh, remember that one I we sent out for the. the the awareness week or whatever. Yeah. But it's, this is looking. This, this is it. I, they must have changed it up. Yeah. Well, otherwise, if you just go, if you go to that FEMA website, you can click on the link from right there. It'll get you the right one. <coughs> go to the Google Play. Mm -hmm. I just said FEMA. That's all. Yeah. Sure yeah, I think you got the right app there. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, because that was the other one that showed up in your phone. Emergency Red Cross. I'm not a big fan of the weather bug. Some people pull that weather bug thing out. I don't know. Yeah. Here's the thing. Yeah. You guys have any questions on anything I just rambled on about? No. I know most of it's kind of like. Ooh. Yeah. I kind of define your job as. You're like the security blanket over the county so everybody gets to sleep instead of worrying about everything that's in his head. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, that's exactly so what it is. So it's about different ways this county's going to just fall apart, right? <laughs> Fortunately, it doesn't happen. So. Well, it's nice to know that somebody is doing that. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. That's the goal that you don't know about it, though, right? Kind of, right? Yeah. So you, yeah. you have that peace of mind. We don't have volcanoes here, so you don't have to worry about volcanoes. Oh, gosh. We got everything else, but <coughs> even earthquakes, so you don't have to worry about this. Yeah, so I think it was Mankato that the last one was actually reported. Um, that, they actually have it written into the uh, Minnesota uh, state plan, too. But uh, chemical spills and that stuff, you know, that's a deal with that. It's pretty likely stuff. So. So if you see in the news, those trains, I don't know. Okay, we need them, but. Airplanes too? Yeah, airplanes, we've had, I don't know what it is about this year. We've had three aviation accidents yeah. this year. Um, wow. One was fatal and the other two, fortunately, were not. Uh, I think there's three, maybe. I don't think there was another one, but. Uh, we average probably one a year, honestly. Um, whether it's a military, because we this is a flight path even for the military training patterns mm -hmm. out of St. Paul. So once, well, I, I think the last one was down uh, maybe Wanamingo or something. I think it did kind of a hard landing down there, helicopter, mm -hmm. and the government doesn't want us around those things when it goes down. We just stay out inside, very outskirts, and they just come in and do their thing, recover their aircraft. But uh, we got a uh, well, Red Wing Airport over here. I think it's the, the crop is just strip out by good use uh, west of there. Is that, that's still there, but the one in Juan Domingo, that's gone. Um, was I think the helicopters, I don't know. Yeah, that was, it was down by there. And then uh, I think there's another uh, 
Was it Stanton or Port 2? Yeah, Stanton. A lot of those experimental aircraft, you don't really need a pilot's license. People just like jump on these things and they want to go fly around like they're, uh, you know. YouTube experts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm scared of heights, so you don't have to worry about me getting up there, so. <laughs> You're tall. That's tall. Yeah, no. Tell me about it. You're scared of being up there, isn't it? <laughs> so, somewhat. Yeah. Well, that's all I got. So, no questions? All right, thank you. Thanks for coming, and I uh, hope you join, uh, enjoy the rest of the academy. And hope well, I appreciate it. Sleep too, brother. <laughs> Keep us safe. Yeah, I'll do my best. All right, so still good? No, don't need a break. All right, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what my job is exactly, and you'll see as we kind of go through um, our time together, I'll use portions of my job to kind of fill in time so that way you're not coming here for an hour, hour and a half. We can get the full time so you get your money's worth um, for coming all this way. So um, I'm, I'm basically just going to explain um, some of the things that I do um, for the sheriff's office. Uh, so like Sheriff Kelly said, uh, my job is paid for by a federal grant. Um, <clears throat> and that was a grant that Marty worked really hard to get for us. Um, and it basically just, it, for the most part, it takes me out of the patrol position and my full-time job is setting up events like this. Um, I do like coffee with the deputy, uh, fishing with the deputy. Um, they give me a budget every year and I use that money to get, get us back into the community and build relationships. So that's the gist of it. So some of the things that I do, um, <clears throat> is anybody familiar with the Lights On program? So the Lights On program is a, it's actually, it's a, it's funded by micro grants up in the cities and it came after the, uh, um, what is his name, um, the gentleman that died, uh, Philandro Castile, after that, um, he got pulled over for having a headlight out or, or brake light. And basically what this program does is it's funded by micro grants and they give us um, basically little books. And so if we pull somebody over for having a headlight out, we can give them a ticket out of that book and it'll pay for them to get new headlights. It'll, it'll pay to fix. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And the reason, and that's, it's kind of, it's, it's based off a couple different things. Like, so first of all, it, if you get pulled over and you got a headlight out and you are living paycheck to paycheck um, and all of a sudden you get a, you get a ticket, I, I don't know how much, let's say it's a $30 ticket and you're paycheck to paycheck. Plus, you got to pay to get that light fixed. Okay, so that's more money. What are you going to do? Are you going to feed your kids or are you going to get your light fixed? Are you going to pay that ticket? You're going to feed your kids, right? So then it starts a vicious cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you, can't, if you can't afford it all, then you don't pay your ticket, then you get a warrant, and everything just escalates. Right. So with this program, it basically just cuts it off. Um, it's not, like I said, it's funded by micro grants, so it doesn't cost the community anything. It's a free program. Um, and that's just one of the things that we've gotten involved with to help build relationships within the community. What's it called? It's called the Lights On program. Lights On. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yep. So basically with this voucher, so you get this, this ticket, um, there's a website on there and there's a list of um, businesses in Goodhue County. They're all over. Um, you just type in your county and it'll tell you what, what businesses will honor that. Mm. And they'll fix up to $200. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, they, they do a really nice job. They When they approached me about getting us involved in this, they said there was only one person they ever turned down, and that's because their car was totaled in a car accident, and they tried to get their lights fixed after it had been totaled, and they're like, we can't, we can't do that. So so they are, they are really, really good at what they do. Um, another program that we offer that's actually unique to our county is called the Game On Program, and basically what that is, um, so I mentioned that I have... I have a budget and at the end of the year, if I have a couple hundred dollars left in my budget, I'll go out and I'll buy basketballs, footballs, um, soccer balls, whatever. And our deputies can carry those around in their squads. If they see some kids playing, they can stop, they can hang out with the kids, they can have conversations, they can play ball with the kids, and then the kids get to keep that ball. Oh, yeah, so it's, it's a great way just to get our, our deputies out of their squads into the community because it's so easy on a patrol shift to just drive and drive and drive and drive and knock it out. When they have the tools to get out, then they get out. So, <clears throat> um, along.
along with that. I mean, we we offer we or we hand out stickers, we do tattoos, we have magnet clips, which I'm sure you guys all get some before you leave. Um, we also have homeless kits. Um, that's basically just a little plastic bag, and some of them have milk. Or not sorry, not milk. Water, um, socks, uh, oatmeal, um, just kind of you know some toiletry products, just stuff to kind of get them through the day. And yep, and this stuff um, also that the supply we have now actually came to us from the state patrol. So again, no cost out of our pockets. So it's nice. Um, we also get a lot of blankets and teddy bears that are donated to us. Um, and we have our officers carry those around too. So if they respond to like a domestic call that has kids, it's easier for them to grab a teddy bear and you know, let's, let's get this kid focused on this. Yeah, so, less yep. scary too. Yep. Um, Citizens Academy, you guys are, you're in the thick of it, so. Uh, I also do a, a car seat program, so anybody with little kids, um, if you have questions about car seats, um, I had to take a 40 hour class to get certified on car seats. It's amazing how much information there is on car seats. So uh, if you ever have any questions about car seats, you, you guys will all have my contact information, you can reach out to me. Uh, Zambroda PD also has um, Shannon over there, she does it. Um, so it's just it's just a resource that we offer to the community to make sure the kids are safe in vehicles. So you 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 have like times that you let people come to you to have their persons checked. Or so checked. so we run clinics. Oh, okay. And then also I mean if somebody if somebody emails me or calls me and says I don't know what I'm doing here, I I, I will go and help them. Yeah. Yeah. Um. We have the, the bike patrol program, which mostly we just run out of Wanamingo for the most part. Is anybody, nobody's from Wanamingo, right? So we can talk bad about them? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm teasing. We might know somebody that lives there. I'm joking, I'm joking. I got your badge number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the summer, uh, in the summer I, when I have time, I like to jump on the bike and just bike around and um, it's amazing how many people are like, what, what, what's going on here? Like, oh. they don't, they don't really see us out like that in the community. Yeah. So, that's kind of cool. Um, I also run the camera registration program. Is anybody familiar with that? Oh. Yeah, what? we have a, a camera registration program. Basically, what that is is if you have exterior cameras on your house, mm -hmm. you can register them through our website. Um, so if your neighbors. Um, car gets broken into that's in their driveway and you have a ring doorbell, we know, we have your information, we, we know that we can reach out to you and say, hey, can you check your cameras? Oh, um, okay. It's 100% voluntary. Um, every step of the way is voluntary. You could register your program with, or register with us. Um, your neighbor's house could get broken into or whatever. We could know for a fact that it was caught on your camera, but at any point you could say, nope. Okay. Yep, so it's 100% voluntary. Um, it's basically just a resource for us to save time instead of trying to go to every single buddy, yeah. everybody's house yeah. to see if they have cameras. It just saves us a lot of time. So does that apply just to, you know, because you're really going to be county mm -hmm. in only a couple of the cities. So if you live in Red Wing, they wouldn't talk to you, would they? Or do you register? Yeah, I, I, I register. I do for the whole county. Irregardless and, of yep. whether it's your control district or not. Yep, yep. And I, I've reached out to all the agencies. And so they know, like, if something happens, they can reach out to me and I'll get them that information. Do you still do the, the checklist? The home premise? Yeah. Yep. You, you did that for Yep, I remember that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, what is that? That's actually the next thing I was going to talk about. Oh, okay. <laughs> so home premise survey is based off of uh, SEPTED training, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And basically a service that we offer is that I will come to your home, um, I'll walk around the exterior of your home, and I'll basically give you tips on how to not become a victim. Um, I'll check your locks, check your doors. Um, it's, it's all sorts of little things like landscaping. Um, if you're thinking about getting any landscaping done, we suggest that you use the little pea-sized rocks instead of the bigger rocks, because the bigger rock, you can smash through a window, and the pea-sized rocks, you can also hear people walking on them better. Oh. It's just a bunch of little stuff like that. I have a whole checklist that I go through. Um, and then, you know, if you have any questions about security cameras um, or anything like that, then I'm there to answer all your questions. So that's another service that we offer. Um, you just sign up right on the Goodhue County Sheriff's Office website. Is that um, called home what? It's a home premise survey. Premise? Yep. Yep. So we discuss landscaping and yeah, basically wow, I just give you suggestions and leave you with a whole bunch of information, right? There's a whole bunch of information. Oh, yeah. um, so you don't have to remember wow. everything. 
And I tell you because it's I leave you with packets of information. So. So so you actually would tell us where to site the security cameras also. I would give you my opinion. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Probably tell us to lock our doors too. Yeah, I would tell you to lock your doors. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty bad about that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the last, the last one. I'm a dog though. She lets me yeah, know. Yeah. She lets you know. But still, I, I don't. I just can't get in the hand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the last one I, I did. I don't want to feel afraid all the time. Yeah. The I last, the last one I did. The guy left the the key in his garage door oh, with his oh. door wide open. I'm like, <laughs> all right, I, I got to flag you on that one. I gotta, I gotta yeah. throw the flag on that one. We can't do that. <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, it's basically just giving tips on how to keep yourself safe at home. So, um, some of the events that we we do, um, Night to Unite or National Night Out, whichever one you prefer to call it, um, we're pretty heavily involved in those. People just let us know that they're having a party and we show up. And that's the first Tuesday of every August. So, um, we do daycare visits. So I'll actually go out to daycares. I'll bring them stickers, I let them climb around my squad car, they can turn on the lights, turn on the sirens, and it's basically just like Marty was saying, build the relationships with the kids when they're young so they know that we're here to help. So, I do skating with a deputy. Anybody have hockey skates? No? <laughs> you got some skates, yeah. So, mostly it's, it's in Pine Island where we mostly do it. We've done a few in Wanamingo and a few in Kenyon. Um, where I basically just go to the rink and I put on skates and I just skate around with the kids and play hockey with them. So. Play hockey in high school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A long time ago. Yep. But women's hockey is really worse than men's. They're better players too. They're faster. <laughs> yeah. And then they have different rules, so they have to be able to do more strategy than. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I grew up playing boys hockey, and then when I was in high school, it changed to girls hockey. So, yeah, I had the best of both worlds. <laughs> um, and then, like Marty was saying, coffee with a deputy, um, which is also in some areas we'll call it badges and brew, and that's like, like in, if we do it in Red Wing, then we'll team up with Red Wing Police Department, so we call it badges and brew. But if it's out Coffee's in coffee, yeah, that's yeah, what we what's that? That's what we have in Zimbabwe State. Badges and brew. Yep. Yep. Um, Otherwise, if it's out like in Wanamingo um, or Pine Island, it's just coffee with the deputy. So, um, fishing with the deputy, we've done that for the past few years. Um, I think we usually host about 40 kids. Um, they come out to Everett's Resort uh, for the day. We feed them lunch, they get shirts. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the shirts on the websites, but there's actually a drawing contest for the shirts. Oh, wow. So, the kids yeah. put in entries. Um, and then the, the winning kid gets to fish directly with the sheriff for the oh, day. Wow. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, we, we feed them lunch. Uh, it's just, just a great, great experience. And with, for that, we team up with the DNR. Um, last year, P Pierce County Sheriff came out, uh, the Wisconsin DNR, we had Minnesota DNR, we had us. Um, it, was, it was a really good, really good turnout. So, and then they also get to keep their fishing poles and they get tackle boxes that they get to keep too. So that way, when they leave, they still have that option to go and do that. And that's basically just to encourage, give them options of things to do instead of getting into trouble. Is the idea behind that? <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of our deputies, uh, 